The stage is yours, and I'm very happy you are also two MVPs, right? Yes, yes that's sure are. Um, Dell seems to have a habit of uh, collecting and cultivating uh, Microsoft MVPs and former Microsoft employees, um, as uh, Jaromir Kasper, who is also presenting, um, has just joined just joined me um, and Michael's team. Um, we're super happy to have him. Um, but yes, yes, we're both Microsoft MVPs. Uh, we were both actually became Microsoft MVPs just this year. Um, so yeah, that's been awesome. Cool. So uh, and also welcome to Michael, right? Um, um, I think I'm right. Michael Welt, is it yes. correct? Yes, thanks, Karsten. <laughs> Thank you for having us. So uh, go on with your session. I'm, I'm very interested in uh, especially the hybrid dreams come true. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, Go on, that, please. That was me. I tend to get a little bit carried away when it comes to um, hybrid and Azure. Um, so yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, we're really glad to be here. Very, very glad to be here. Um, we will do some quick introductions. Um, Michael will share for you the agenda that we've got today. We'll spend about 30 to 35 minutes talking um maybe 40 minutes we'll see um and then we'll have time for q a so any questions get them into the q a function and we'll have time at the end to chat through them and really looking forward to doing that with everyone who who is here today so i will start by introducing myself my name is lisa clark um and i work at dell technologies um, I'm based in Dundee, Scotland. So hello everyone from Scotland. Um, I've been in the IT industry for over 10 years now, which is, seems a little bit crazy. Um, I'm responsible for driving the Dell Azure Stack business across EMEA. Um, our team is responsible for evangelizing the product and enabling our sales and our pre-sales um, teams, supporting our partners when it comes to um, realizing their Azure hybrid dreams and um, we're all we're the team to make your dreams your Azure hybrid dreams come true um, I also kicked off a podcast called Lisa at the Edge in 2020 when we were all in lockdown and um, so I thought it was a bit now or never um, and then I was also lucky enough to be awarded Microsoft Community Hero and Inclusive Leader badges um, I think that was the end of 2019 beginning of 2020 and uh, so yes, yeah, super happy to be here and can't wait to, to talk more about the, the Dell offering when it comes to Azure Stack HCI. Um, I will hand over to my teammate and friend Michael to introduce himself. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so like Lisa, I'm part of the engineering technologist team uh, here at Dell Technologies, specifically covering uh, the Azure Stack portfolio of products. So Azure Stack Hub, Azure Stack HCI. Um, uh, this is what we do all day is, is, is uh, talk Azure Stack. So we, we are the, the deep technical resources within our organization um, supporting our, our, our sales teams and, and our customers. Uh, I joined Dell back in 2015. Um, uh, this has been my first uh, venture into the vendor side. Before that, I was always on the customer side. Uh, so throughout my career, I started out doing uh, software support, moved into development, moved, became an application architect, and then shifted over to database administration. So um, always uh, the entire time being in the, the Microsoft space. Um, love to be active in the community, um, love supporting user groups. Uh, I've had the, the privilege to speak at a number of different conferences. Um, and so I, I always love to take every opportunity to talk tech uh, uh, whenever possible. Um, I just love to share my love and passion for the technology with everybody that I can. Um, that included running a user group for a number of years, uh, but um, a few years back we relocated uh, from Florida up uh, north. Uh, so uh, my wife and my uh, two-year-old daughter, uh, we are now in uh, upstate New York. So um, much different climate, uh, loving having seasons again. Um, and, and um, as was mentioned, Lisa and I are both um, Microsoft Azure MVPs. 
And I would just like to point out that I was responsible for writing our names and our roles on the slides, and I have, I have not updated Michael's role. So Michael is actually uh, a senior uh, principal um, engineer. <laughs> and, uh, and not actually, he's got my role. He's got my role. <laughs> I completely missed that. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what we're going to cover today, so we're going to talk about just laying the groundwork, um, the, the different options for uh, getting Azure Stack HCI from an OEM, the, the validated nodes versus integrated systems. Uh, we're going to go into detail on the Dell EMC solution for Azure Stack HCI. So um, what's different about our solution or what makes our solution uh, unique? We're going to dive into some really cool new announcements around the Dell hardware. Um, uh, and then follow that up with some uh, uh, just as cool announcements around our open manage integration and our management environment for that. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with, with some summary information. Mm -hmm. So I will hand it back to Lisa. This is an interesting session for us because um, it's not often that we get to fully focus in just on the, the Dell side of things. So quite often within our role, we go out there and we're actually pitching the Microsoft message and the Azure Hybrid by Design and Azure Stack and Azure Arc. And um, but today we just get to sort of drill down on the Dell stuff, which is which is nice. Um, so yeah, we thought we would just take a little bit of time to set the scene um, in terms of a validated node versus integrated system. Um, because these are the two hardware options um, available for deploying Azure Stack HCI. So OEMs who were looking to offer hardware solutions for Azure Stack HCI had the option of offering validated nodes and or integrated systems. Dell Technologies chose to go down the integrated system route based on our experience with VxRail, with vSAN Ready nodes, our past experience with reference architectures and ready nodes for S2D and our other Microsoft solutions, we decided that the integrated system was the one for us, that the integrated system was the way to deliver on your hybrid, um, hybrid dreams. Um, and that's because at Dell, Dell is fully on board with the fact that this is an integrated Azure experience. And therefore it was extremely important to us to focus on the delivery of a fully productized offering which would allow customers to spend that time innovating with the, you know, this new ability to have Azure capability on prem. So what's the difference between the validated node and the integrated system? Well, of course, um, both options, ha the hardware is validated for the new operating system. Um, but then the story continues with the with the integrated system and you're getting a lot more. And I personally think that's really important when you're thinking about the fact that you are running a, an Azure service and then consuming more Azure services on top. Um, you want to ensure that this platform is configured and it's optimized for running your workloads and, and your additional Azure services. And you also want to be able to focus on the new Azure functionality and capability rather than thinking too much about the infrastructure that it's running on. So there's a few um, boxes that must be ticked for an integrated system um, and the level at which they are ticked um, can differ between different OEMs. Um, so the integrated system must include the pre-installation of the Azure Stack HCI operating sister, sy system either uh, via factory installation or as part of the deployment process. Um, Dell Technologies has recently announced the uh, factory installed OS across all of our AX nodes. Another requirement is that there must be tooling integration into Windows Admin Center to allow for lifecycle management. So Dell Technologies has developed the specific integrations between Open Manage and Windows Admin Center for full stack, fully automated lifecycle management. Um, OEMs and Microsoft must have collaborative support. Dell Technologies, we've been in this uh, game for a while with Microsoft. We've got our engineers co-located in Microsoft headquarters. We've got integrated end-to-end -end, uh, back-end support systems, um, which means that we can support the full solution, so both the hardware and the operating system, which is pretty cool. And we, of course, have joint testing agreements with Microsoft and invest a serious amount of engineering hours and manpower into validating and testing our solutions. And um, so that's just kind of setting the scene 
validate nodes integrated system we chose the integrated system path and we have gone full steam ahead on that path i just want to share this slide because i just like to highlight the strength of our partnership with microsoft and um, we're known for our partnership with vmware but maybe maybe not as well known for our partnership with microsoft and um, which is interesting because it's an extremely strong partnership um, not only are we number one in all the segments that matter when you're looking at hyperconverged infrastructure, we're also number one in the Microsoft solution segment. Um, and the reason for this is that we've been partners for over 30 years. We are the largest Microsoft partner um, and invest heavily in engineering power, like I've said, when it comes to developing these solutions. And I think that's important to keep in mind. It's, uh, it's why people like myself uh, and my teammates who are you know, Microsoft MVPs or massive uh, advocates of Microsoft choose to come and be part of this Dell team. Also, our team's pretty awesome, so that helps. <laughs> um, so when it came to developing our integrated system, we wanted to deliver immediate value and eliminate any friction between deploying, maintaining and updating the infrastructure and getting stuck into the Azure integration. We wanted just to remove any um, sort of friction between between those uh, between those elements. We decided, like I said, to go all in on the integrated system. We took a fully productized approach, applying our hyperconverged expertise. Um, we are committed to investing and updating this offering for years to come. At the end of the day, Azure is hybrid by design. Hybrid is here to stay and we want to be the partner who helps deliver on these Azure hybrid dreams and make them a reality. Um, because we understand that this is a truly integrated Azure experience, we see it much more than just validating hardware. We want to do it as much as possible um, to help ensure that the platform is the right one for our customer workloads. <laughs> um, and so by fully productizing um, this offering, we are able to support the entire solution, which includes the hardware and the operating system. So whether you have an issue with storage spaces or networking or the operating system, we, we can support it. Um, next slide, please, Michael. Um, so our AX nodes, much of this will be this sort of build up will be familiar to you all here, but our AX, AX nodes lay the foundation for our Azure Stack HCI integrated system. What are AX nodes? Um, they are our award-winning PowerEdge servers, which have been specifically architected and designed for our Microsoft hyperconverged infrastructure ecosystem. We offer multiple configuration options of hardware that have been validated and guaranteed to deliver the optimal balance of um, performance and capacity to address the, the broad set of Azure Stack HCI use cases and workloads. Um, it's now available on 15G configurations with the latest generations of both Intel and AMD CPUs, um, which deliver breakthrough performance um, and density for use cases, including Edge and Robo and data center um, consolidation. Um, so the AX nodes are really the beginning um, of realizing all of your Azure hybrid dreams. <laughs> um, like I said, Delt, we've uh, introduced factory installed um, Azure Stack HCI operating system across all of our AX nodes um, to remove the step from the deployment process. It reduces the complexity of installation and the reliance on professional services and the support team. So we reduce our customers cost and help them get up and running as fast as possible. We've invested heavily in our open managed integration for Azure Stack HCI, which really does differentiate us not only as an integrated system over the validated nodes, but really in the players who offer, it, offer the integrated systems as well. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Michael's going to go into more detail um, in a moment. However, I would like to highlight some pretty impressive stats from the, the work of our awesome technical marketing team. So Mike Lamia, shout out to Mike Lamia, um, is part of our technical marketing team and he does not like to publish stats that he cannot stand behind. <laughs> and these stats were so good, we were nervous to put them out because they seem unbelievable, but they are entirely valid. Um, so what Mike did was 
he took the time to get really, really good at manually deploying and updating. So he did it again and again and again and again and again until he was satisfied that he was, he knew what he was doing. He was an expert and and uh, and he was like at the top of his game when it came to manually deploying and updating the system. And then what he did is he tested that against the using our open manage integration. And the results were pretty crazy, right? So they were 97% less attended time required for the updates and an 82% reduction in manual steps. Um, this is super impressive and it absolutely delivers on the goals that we set out when developing our integrated system. Um, since Mike wrote that white paper and did that testing, we've continued to invest in and develop our integration with Windows Admin Center. So yeah, not all integrated systems are created equal. Uh, Lifecycle management from Dell means fully automated for both the hardware updates and the Microsoft updates, which I think is pretty spectacular. Um, so it's safe to say that when it comes to deployment and support, we've, we've got you covered. We've got our Azure Stack HCI customers covered. Um, the most important point here really is that by delivering this integrated system, we are able to provide um, one stop cluster level support for the hardware and the software. So like I said, whether you've got an issue with the operating system or storage spaces direct or um, the networking, our certified engineers are ready to assist. Um, so this gives you a high level view of um, our Azure Stack HCI offering and some of our differentiators. Um, Michael's going to take us through a little bit more in depth um, through our AX node portfolio and our open manage integration um, in a bit more depth. Um, so I'll hand over to Michael um, and let him let him take it away. I've potentially rushed through that a little bit. I get very excited. I get very excited about our Azure Stack uh, integrated system. But it just means more opportunity, potentially more opportunities for a chat at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hand over to you, Michael. So um, now we're going to go deep into the, the hardware itself. Right? So what's new for um, the Dell AX nodes that, that Lisa um, uh, introduced you to? Well, the first thing, and this is um, brand new, hot off the presses, uh, we now have Intel-based uh, 15G configurations for Azure Stack HCI. These are two new uh, chassis configurations uh, built around the Intel Xeon third gen processors. Uh, these are the Ice Lake processors. Um, and then along with that, we've introduced additional uh, enhanced WAC integration um, to, to be able to, to um, uh, better manage those systems. Right. So the first one we're going to look at is the AX650. Um, again, built around Intel Ice Lake. Uh, so this is a 1U two socket system. So available from 16 cores all the way up to 80 cores per node, uh, all the way up to four terabytes of memory um, uh, per node. Uh, this configuration will support 10 drives. Uh, so you can get up to uh, just under 77 terabytes uh, maximum raw storage. Uh, we have this available in all flash configurations, all SSD and all NVMe. Uh, we also have this available in hybrid configurations, so SSD plus spinning disk. Um, because these are the new uh, third gen Intel systems, uh, they are the new uh, PCIe Gen 4. Uh, we have an increased number of PCI slots. Uh, which make these uh, GPU ready when those GPU configurations are available later on. All right. Uh, these uh, 15G systems also introduce our new BOSS 2 cards, uh, which are hot pluggable uh, M.2 drives for the operating system. That means if you were to have an issue with one of the disks, um, you could uh, pull that disk and pop in a new one. It will automatically start rebuilding that virtual disk. Uh, without interrupting the workloads running on that system, without having to reboot that node. And of course, this supports the uh, secured core uh, when that's released with the new uh, HCI OS. Next up is our AX750. This is a 2U two socket system. So uh, again, it's the same 16 to 80 core configurations, 
uh, up to four terabytes of memory, but this time instead of 10 drives, uh, we can support uh, up to 24 drives. So that pushes this up to 184 terabytes max raw storage per node. Uh, uh, at initial launch, uh, it'll be available in an all flash configuration, all SSD, but we'll have all NVMe and hybrid configurations uh, following shortly behind. Um, uh, for PCIe Gen 4 slots, uh, and then uh, again, uh, GPU ready configurations. So uh, these will be uh, um, eligible for GPU upgrades when those are available. Add that to our uh, existing portfolio. We have the AX7525. This is uh, AMD based configuration. Uh, this is a 2U two socket system. Uh, again, uh, 24 drives. Um, this uh, is supporting both the uh, second gen and third gen uh, AMD EPIC processors. So up to 128 cores per node uh, are available within these configurations. So if you're looking for compute density, um, this, is, uh, this is certainly a way to do it. We also have uh, for more of the edge use cases, the 6515. Uh, this is again based on the, the uh, AMD EPIC uh, second and third gen processors. Uh, so you can get up to 64 cores, but with it being a single socket, it's a um, shorter depth server, uh, but it's still capable of those high uh, core counts. So you can still get 64 cores within this. All right, uh, and then on top of that, our existing Cascade Lake based systems, our 14G systems. Uh, so these are available uh, with Cascade Lake and Cascade Lake refresh processors. Uh, the 740XD is our two socket 2U system. Uh, and then the AX640 is our 1U uh, two socket system. So all this comes together to, um, to form a, a pretty extensive portfolio as far as uh, form factors, capabilities, densities. Um, so the, a lot of available configurations uh, to meet the needs of your workloads. Uh, you'll see that um, with the 750, we'll have the additional configurations coming post RTS. Uh, what's available now is the all flash, all SSD version. Um, uh, you'll also notice with these, uh, we have called out specific configurations as being validated with stretch clustering. Um, so we've taken the extra step of validating those specific configurations um, with stretch clustering, right, to ensure that they're going to work properly. Um, that doesn't mean the other systems can't support stretch clustering, um, but because of um, the change data capture, the, the, um, the logging requirements, uh, to be able to, to track those changes as they occur. Um, you want fast storage to be able to apply those changes on the target side. So having that high performing storage makes a difference. So we've, we've um, made our focus those um, faster storage subsystems, um, but the other ones are, are gonna depend on the workload. Right. And then of course, all of the security of our PowerEdge system and with our new systems, the um, AMD Epic Gen 3 and the Intel Scalable Gen 3 processors are secured core server ready, right? So when that feature is available within the operating system, our hardware platform is already ready to take advantage of that. So that's with the hardware. Um, so now we'll dive into the open managed integration. So what good is great hardware if it's difficult to manage? So we've had our open managed integration with Windows Admin Center uh, for uh, a few years now, um, having the ability to do inventory monitoring um, update. Uh, it talks directly to the IDRAX within the nodes, so it's agentless. You don't have to install anything into the operating system. It doesn't require open manage enterprise running in the environment. I mean, if you're running it, great, but it doesn't have to be there. The uh, Windows Admin Center uh, extension is talking directly to the IDRAX within the nodes. So what can you do with it? Cluster monitoring and management, right? Real-time health status, overall cluster status, you can get status by the node, look at the health of individual components, 
um, hardware and firmware inventory um, on those systems, right? All from within Windows Admin Center without having to leave that tool, right? It just shows up under the left-hand navigation. Under extensions, you see that Dell EMC Open Manage integration. All right, uh, our 2.0 release, uh, we introduced um, uh, additional automation for deployment as well as for uh, full stack cluster aware updates. So with the automated cluster creation, um, if you saw um, one of the sessions earlier this morning, you saw the, the process of creating uh, an Azure Stack HCI cluster using Windows Admin Center. Uh, what we've done is we've incorporated into that process through our extension, the hardware checks for that cluster creation. All right, so we're going to go through and check hardware compatibility. We're gonna check symmetry and make sure all the nodes match. Uh, we're going to make sure that all of the firmware and everything is at the same level across all the nodes. If it's not, um, you're able to remediate that and update those components right within the cluster creation wizard so that you don't have to stop what you're doing, go update something, and then go back to, to recreate the cluster. Why does this matter? Well, it prevents a lot of those issues that you could run into uh, if your nodes aren't matched or if the firmware levels are different between the nodes. If you have inconsistency problems, we eliminate that possibility by validating everything in advance uh, while you're trying to create that cluster. Full stack lifecycle management. So we introduced lifecycle management uh, through our cluster aware updating process in our 1.1 release. Uh, with our 2.0 release, we added support for updating the operating system for HCI OS. So now you have the ability within a single workflow to do OS updates, BIOS, firmware, and driver updates. Single automated workflow, one reboot per node. And because it's a cluster aware update, it's gonna handle migrating the workloads. Um, so draining that node before it takes it out and applies the updates to it. So you're not taking any of your workloads offline during this process, All right? It is going to use, uh, by default, it's gonna use our online catalog. Um, but you do have the ability through the Dell EMC repository manager to create an offline catalog uh, if you'd like to. All right, and it's going to give you this nice compliance report uh, and be able to remediate um, anything that's out of compliance. All right, so let me jump out and do a quick demo here. Uh, for anybody who hasn't seen this, this is our interactive demo center. Uh, I'll have a link for this later in the, the deck. Uh, but this allows you to demo functionality um, of, of our systems. Uh, we have a number of different capabilities in here, and this is open to everybody. So what I'm gonna do is jump in and start the uh, one-click full stack update. Right. So as you can see, we are in um, Windows Admin Center. So check for updates. It's found some operating system updates. Now we're gonna do hardware updates. With this capability, you see the, the Dell Technologies extensions being um, called right from the Microsoft update piece. So we're gonna say get updates. I'm gonna pick the update source that I wanna use. So it defaults to the online catalog, but again, I can use an offline catalog if I'd like to. Then it's gonna generate the compliance report. So it's gonna go through the inventory on those systems and it's gonna tell me if anything is out of compliance with that update catalog. So now I can see the summary. Here's the work that it's going to perform. I can go ahead and download those updates. So I'm gonna pre-stage those updates. So pull everything down first. Um, the update catalog, I, I just kind of glossed over it, but it's, it's important to understand the value of that update catalog. I'm not going out to dell.com slash support and pulling down random PowerEdge drivers, right? We view this as an integrated system as a solution. So we maintain an update catalog specifically for Azure Stack HCI. Everything in that catalog has been validated to work together and to work with HCI OS. 
So you don't have any more questions as to what version of this driver do I need or what version of this firmware should I be or is this going to conflict with that? None of that, it, you don't have any of those questions because we've already tested and validated everything together. So when you're pulling from that repository, you're always pulling the latest validated configurations from us. All right. So now that I've downloaded those updates, I'm going to go on to install. All right. I can see here it's going to install the Windows update and then it's going to install some solution updates and go. And here it's actually going through. Um, draining the node, um, applying the updates, rebooting the node, bringing it back in, moving to the next node in the cluster. All right, so we'll go ahead and jump back to the slide deck here. So that is the full stack um, lifecycle management. One of the things you didn't see, but you do have that capability is not just running the remediation immediately, but you have the option of scheduling that remediation to take place at a later time. And so maybe you've got a maintenance window over the weekend that you wanna hit. You don't have to wait until the weekend to run the compliance check. You can run that compliance check well in advance and then schedule that update to take place later on. The newest updates to, to our uh, Windows Admin Center integration. Uh, so we just had our 2.1 release that's now available. Um, so if you go out to Windows Admin Center and look at the extensions, you'll see 2.1. So we've introduced CPU core management and automation around cluster expansion. So let's talk about CPU core management. Um, why does this matter? Right. So Azure Stack HCI is consumed as an Azure service. That means you're paying per core monthly on your Azure bill for the size of that cluster. Right. Microsoft allows you to change the number of CPU cores within the BIOS to disable certain cores. The operating system doesn't see them. It doesn't report those back up to Microsoft and therefore your spend, your OPEX spend is decreased. Why is this important? Well, it allows you to spend a little bit more on the hardware budget and get a higher core count CPU, but then disable some of those cores in the BIOS so that you're not immediately hit with the OPEX cost associated with that, but you can scale up over time as the workload requires it. So now you have the ability to scale up the nodes as your compute requirements increase without having to scale out to more nodes immediately, right? Or hitting that full spend right from day one. This is intended to allow you to grow that over time as your CPU demands increase, right? As your processing demands increase. This is not intended for gaming the system, right? So this is, um, it's not, um, do this core count today and that core count tomorrow or anything like that. The intent is this allows you to easily adjust your core count to the right size for your workload and then over time be able to scale that core count as you need to. So we'll just do a quick look at what that looks like. All right, um, I apologize, the call outs are in here. We are looking at a pre-release copy of this demo. Uh, this demo will be published out to the demo center uh, by the end of next week. Um, so uh, you'll have the same experience and, and everybody will be able to access it once it's published. Uh, but for now, we're looking at a pre-release version. So in the Dell EMC Open Manage integrations, you can see I'm on the server, um, or excuse me, I'm on the cluster here. I click the integration. Uh, I'm going to click configure. Uh, this particular system is a four node 6515 cluster um, with um, 24 core processors. So if I look at the node level details, you can see here are the nodes within the cluster, single CPU, 24 cores. I can look at the individual node and I can see the node details. I can see um, the, the um, CPU features that are available. But what I want to do is I want to update the CPU core count. Now, the first thing you're going to notice here is I have two sliders. 
uh, CCDs per processor and cores per CCD. I'm seeing this because this is an AMD EPIC system, right? The, the CCDs are core complexes, so you have a certain number of core complexes, and then each core complex has a number of cores. If this was an Intel-based system, I would see a single slider that is cores per processor, right? But because this is an AMD system, I have the two sliders. So what I want to do is I want to reduce my core count. I'm going to cut it in half. So I'm going to change the number of CCDs per processor down to three, and I'm going to change the number of cores per CCD down to four, right? I have the option to apply this now. It is It does require a reboot of the system. So we are going to leverage that cluster aware update capability to drain the roles off the node um, and, and update and reboot each node, or I could apply this at the next reboot. So if I wanted to schedule the reboot to occur during uh, a maintenance window, I can uh, I can set that to happen later. All right, but I'm going to go ahead and say apply and reboot now. So if I click on the view details here, I can see the update in progress. You can see that it's running on node four at the moment. So we'll flip over to failover cluster manager. It's draining the roles from that node. So if I look at the roles, I can see that it's live migrating those VMs. All right, so I will flip back over to nodes. We'll see that that node is paused. It's now going down for the reboot. Flip back over. We can see that that node status is restarting. It succeeded, so now it's moved on to another node. All right, so everything. All right, so we're restarting that node. And it's going to continue to run through the remaining nodes within the cluster. All right, and that's it. I have now updated the core count within those nodes. So now if I come over here, I can see my current core count is 48. I have 48 available cores, maximum core is 96. If I look at the node level details, I can now see that each node has uh, 12 cores per CPU that are currently enabled. And again, if I look in here, I can see that 12 cores. Right, and so that's how the dynamic core management piece works. Streamline cluster node expansion. So similar to the way we incorporated our integration into the cluster creation, we have that capability now to uh, do that within cluster expansion. So if you're expanding an, ex expanding an existing cluster, adding additional nodes into it, we're going to be able to provide those same hardware validations uh, and ensure everything is running at the same level. All right, so you'd be able to see the, the configuration profile, any warnings uh, related to uh, node configurations, um, the hardware configurations within the nodes, drive configurations, things like that. You'll be able to see the update compliance. You can see that in this particular case, there's seven uh, components that are not at the correct update version, and you'll actually be able to remediate those as part of the cluster expansion. So again, you're not having to drop out of the cluster expansion process to then bring things up to date and then bring it back in. Uh, and again, this is to help prevent those issues uh, from things not being consistent within the cluster. So this all comes to uh, our uh, our solution as a whole and, and what the reason around why we believe the integrated system is the right way to deploy Azure Stack HCI. Right. By having a fully productized solution, um, we can offer consistent outcomes with those configurations. Right, We've validated all of the configurations. We maintain those. We've committed to maintaining those for years to come. We have a, a wide portfolio of offerings specialized for uh, multiple use cases, uh, different capacities, different performance points, um, and that portfolio is growing all the time. We have the um, 
extensive lifecycle management and integrated tooling uh, that we've built around this and that we continue to enhance over time to be able to increase the functionality that you can do directly from within Windows Admin Center and to make those outcomes more consistent. Right, so to to cut down on cluster creation failures, to cut down on cluster expansion failures, to ensure that things are being done right from the beginning so that you don't have to spend time keeping the lights on and you can focus on that innovation. Right, the high performance architecture, um, we've pretty much standardized on 25 gig for everything, but we do also have 100 gig RDMA uh, available for those really high performance um, solutions and all of this is backed by the global availability support deployment services professional services um, uh, from Dell EMC. We've got some questions Michael so I think now is as good as time as any to um, go through them. So one uh, question that came through that I have answered and published was um, open manage is it included in the in integrated system cost or you know is it like an additional cost and um, the open managed integrations are included in the cost of our ax nodes so that's one answered and um, the other one another question is um in ax node switch list topology can we upgrade from two no two node cluster to three nodes cluster or uh, would we need to rebuild the cluster um Michael, I think for expansion, you need to be starting with a three node. Well, so so the 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 challenge here is switchless, right? So um, the the way we identify these options, we have what we call switchless and what we call scalable, right? Um, switchless configurations are much harder to uh, to scale because it often involves the addition of new hardware into the system, right? So um, you may have to add additional NICs into the chassis to be able to support that expansion. Um, it changes the cabling, uh, the way you have to cable the nodes together. Um, so it's we we don't do expansion on switchless configurations. If you want to do expansion, if you if you think there's a chance that that cluster is going to grow over time. Um, you really should look at, at what we call a scalable configuration and a scalable configuration can also start at two nodes, but can go all the way up to 16 nodes and that does use um, uh, storage uh, uh, storage switches, right? So RDMA switches uh, to provide those storage networks. Um, the other challenge with scaling of switchless configurations is we support switchless configurations in two node, three node and four node um, uh, clusters. Uh, so if you've gone switchless, even if we gave you the ability to expand from two to three nodes or from three to four, you don't you've got a physical limitation. You cannot expand beyond that point. Uh, so you, if if you think that there's a chance that you're going to need to scale that cluster over time, um, scalable is really the direction that you should be going. Um, you can, if you want, if you're trying to limit the cost associated with the networking piece, um, you can, we support both converged and non-converged networking. So um, in, in either of those cases, you can be using the same top of rack switches for both the storage network and the application network, um, or you can run fully converged in which you're using the same NICs um, uh, for both the storage network and, and the application and management network. So we do have those configurations available to help um, uh, adjust the cost or, or to account for the cost of the networking piece. Uh, but really those switchless configurations are intended for those robo use cases where you know your workload's not going to exceed a certain size. You know two nodes is going to account for that workload or three nodes is going to account for that workload. Um, but it's a remote site where you don't have IT staff in that site. You don't want the cost of storage switches. You don't want to have to maintain um, uh, the, the firmware and the configuration on storage switches because it's not necessary. So if you think, um, uh, for instance, retail, right? So uh, you, you want to have um, 
uh, hardware on site to be able to run the applications that the store needs to, to function, but you don't maintain an, an IT staff in the store. Uh, at best, you have regional resources that might be able to get out there uh, tomorrow or a couple days from now. So minimizing the infrastructure that you have to maintain at those sites really makes a difference. But you know that that site's not going to add more registers. You know that that site's not going to. Uh, it, there's already other limitations in place where that workload's not going to scale. That's where I would implement switchless. But if there's a chance of, of scaling that cluster over time, you're really better off doing a scalable cluster uh, with, with switches. So we've got a few more other questions. The problem is, is that whoever's an asking them is anonymous. So I'm going to guess that the most recent one is related back to the switch question that you've just answered. Um, from performance perspective, what is the recommended design, converged or non-converged? Um, so there's, that's driven by the workload. Right, so non-converged is going to give you the best performance because you are not competing with application traffic for the storage, right? So storage needs to, um, the, when we talk about storage operations, so we're talking about being able to retrieve those, um, the, the, the rebuild and rebalance operations. So being able to write blocks out uh, and being able to copy blocks or move blocks over. Um, that traffic is important, right? You need to have bandwidth. If you have a drive failure or uh, you have a node that goes down, those rebuild rebalance operations should take place as quickly as possible. So you will want to allow for that traffic. Um, if you're doing converged, uh, you can set hardware or excuse me, you can set uh, quality of service. You can set bandwidth limitations uh, so that the, the application traffic can't go, can't pressure the, the storage traffic. Uh, but obviously, if, if you are very performance sensitive, having those isolated out onto separate uh, networks is going to give you the best performance. Now, the question is, what? how much performance is good enough for the workload you're trying to accomplish? So you need to balance that performance with the complexity and the management. OK. Next question. Sorry, Michael, I'm firing them all at you. Um, hey, that's fine. Can I add three times 25 gig dual port NICs in the AX750 servers, three times Mellanox, for example, or what max amount of NICs with what max speed is possible? Um, I will have to take the maximum number of NICs question offline. Um, maximum speed we support today is 100 gig. Um, and that is the Mellanox Connect X6 cards. Uh, are capable of 100 gig. Uh, and with the 15G servers and PCI Gen 4, uh, that is true 100 gig, not because um, not, you're no longer limited by the speed of the PCI Gen 3 bus. Um, so with the, the new 15G systems, PCI Gen 4 and the Mellanox Connect X6 cards, uh, we are 100 gig capable. Uh, and within the switching family, um, we have the 5236, Six, I believe it's the 5236 um, switch is uh, fully 100 gig. So it's it's 36 ports of 100 gig uh, performance. Uh, so we can certainly do those high performance situations. Um, but as far as the maximum number of NICs, so generally what we would do is we would have um, a single RDMA NIC that is two ports. Uh, and then we would have uh, in a non or uh, yep yeah, in a non converged setting, we would then have a second uh, network card for the application and management traffic. Um, so the the RDMA card is going to handle your storage network, and the uh, rest of it is going to go through the application management NICs, uh, and that's generally another two port or four port NIC um, that can connect up to the same switch, different set of ports. Uh, with different VLANs or it connect, can connect up to a completely separate switch. So say, for instance, if you already have an application, a uh, set of application switches within your environment that you want to connect into, you can use your application and management traffic against those. Um, I hope that answered the question. Thanks, Michael. Um, just looking through uh, some other questions. So in the presentation, we've mentioned AX nodes and S2D ready nodes. 
um, our S2D ready nodes a different series. So we, sh I, we shouldn't really, S2D ready nodes should not appear in the presentation. Uh, th there were a couple slides where S2D ready nodes were mentioned, and that's for backwards compatibility. Okay. Uh, the S2D ready nodes were the predecessor to yes. our AX nodes. So yes. S2D ready nodes were a validated system. Uh, they were built around the uh, uh, WSSD program, the Windows Server Software Defined. Uh, so those, when we initially launched, those were um, based on Windows Server 2016. They eventually went to Windows Server 2019. Um, we we don't sell S2D ready nodes anymore, right? So if they're, if they're out there, um, we have the ability in, in some cases to, um, uh, to provide the uh, elevated licensing so that you can add matching AX nodes into the cluster and get the entire cluster up to the AX node capability level. Um, but as far as new servers, we don't offer the S2D ready nodes anymore. Everything's moved over to the AX nodes yep. um, over to that integrated system. Yep, yep. OK, um, there's no more questions um, currently in the chat. I know we've got um, some sessions upcoming that we want to give a shout out to. If you do have any more questions, pop them in the, the q and um, we've got a couple of minutes so we can take them um, if you do want to find out if you want to find out more um, about the Azure Stack HCI integrated system from Dell Technologies then 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 definitely um, take a trip to our I would definitely go to the info hub page that is where you'll find all of our white papers our videos um, there's some really really great content there um, I would definitely go there. You've got the demo center link there as well. Um, so you can go and walk through the demos for yourself. Um, but yeah, if you want to learn more, here is all of the information. Yeah, Lisa and Michael, actually, I have a question. Carsten speaking. Can you hear me? Yes, yes absolutely. Go right ahead, Carsten. Cool. So you showed this nice uh, Windows Admin Center integration. I, I know the uh, Open Manage add-in, but you showed some things that were very cool. So my question is, when it is when is it available public uh, publicly? You mentioned that it's available in the demo center end of next week, but how can customers get it? Because I have already done uh, installations with Dell hardware, and uh, that looks that looks very nice. So the, the Open Manage integration for Windows Admin Center uh, 2.1 is already available uh, in Windows Admin Center. So you can already update the extension to that 2.1 version. Uh, and as long as you're running AX nodes, um, that feature and capability is there. OK, cool. So I, I have a, a tip that, uh, that I ran into with, uh, with the customer deployment. So when you use the Windows Admin Center update of Azure Stack HCI, it will install a cow role on the servers and uh, put in a schedule for the third Tuesday of the month, 3 a.m. in the morning. So you have to be aware if you use this update part in Azure uh, from WAC, that's uh, that's a preferred way for Microsoft, that it that there will be an automatically update every third, third Tuesday uh, every month at 3 o'clock in the morning. So some customers maybe don't want their cluster self update itself, and I assume it will also uh, is also true for the hardware components because it's an integral uh, part of uh, the win uh, the um, cluster aware update, right? Well, so the, the cluster aware update uses a separate scheduling function that's okay. within our extension. So it's not going to use the WAC automation. So when WAC does that automatic update of Windows Admin Center, it's doing that on the Windows Admin Center host. Um, when we talk about the cluster aware updating and the ability to schedule that to occur, that's using a different scheduler. So what you're doing is you're running through, doing the compliance check, identifying that there are components that need to be updated, and then you get to specify the date and time that you want that update to execute. And that's completely separate from the auto update within Windows Admin Center. Um, you also have the ability um, to, if you want to, you can do the, the um, install now where it will immediately go and, and apply those updates. 
Um, but the that scheduling feature is is something new that was added in uh, in 2.0 um, to give you the ability to to shift those updates to occur during a maintenance window. OK, that's really great to to uh, to hear because I think some customers are afraid doing something like firmware updates or driver updates automatically. They want to they want to have a look on it when it's done and so. So that, that's uh, that's really great. And I have another question. Um, you mentioned the differentiation between an integrated system and certified nodes. As far as I know, I don't know if it's true also for uh, for certified nodes, but with an integrated system, the vendor also um, agrees to update the firmware and the drivers of the components for five years, right? Because we had some issues in the past, not with Dell, with other vendors where uh, there was no, no new firmware for some components, um, for example, for Windows Server 2019. So a customer, uh, bought an installation late in 20 or early in 2019 and then uh, wanted to update to to the 2019 operating system but his hardware was not certified for 2019 so i, I as far as i know for an integrated system that is a must that uh, that you uh, that you agree with uh, with the microsoft contract to do that for 5 years for the systems right or am i wrong no, that is absolutely correct, and that, that is a requirement of the integrated systems. It's part of what we call that joint support agreement um, yeah. that, that, that we agree to support those systems for um, a, a given period of time. Um, so, so yes, we have to, to, to commit to providing those firmware BIOS and, and driver updates for that period of time uh, for certifying the platform for the new versions of the operating system. That's not something that's required of a validated node. So that's okay. another important distinction. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. So if there are no more questions, are there more questions? Um, I don't think so. Some are just comments um, in the Q&A. Um, I think we've answered all the main questions, um, but we just wanted to give a shout out to some of the up and coming sessions that we're particularly interested in. Um, the Azure Stack HCI roadmap session is straight after this one, so we'll be hanging around for that. Um, Michael, you're particularly looking forward to the Secure Core server yes. session. Um, so as I had mentioned, our 15G platforms, if you're using the third gen AMD and the third gen Intel, um, are already ready for Secure Core when that feature is released in, in HCI OS. If you're um, interested in learning more about what Secure Core is, um, uh, I recommend uh, checking out the session. It's the last session of the day, um, Secure Core Server for Azure Stack HCI. Uh, and then, of course, we, we have to mention uh, Yarmir's session uh, at the start of tomorrow uh, covering um, uh, his uh, new HCI uh, 21H2 features uh, with MS Lab. He's been putting a lot of work into updates for MS Lab to be able to support um, testing 21H2, uh, adding new capabilities, being able to, to use MS Lab to test on bare metal hardware and not just on virtual machines, um, uh, incorporating hardware updates into the process. He's doing more work related to the operating system. So absolutely check out his session tomorrow uh, for more information on, on what he's doing with MS Lab. Yeah, absolutely. And then because of the, the slight schedule update, really looking forward to the panel discussion tomorrow as well. So yes, yeah, super excited to be here. Thanks again, Carson, for having us. Um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the event. Yeah, thanks so much, guys. It was a great presentation, Lisa and Michael. Uh, really nice having you.